of the China and Russia uh, currency pact, uh, I think that, as I sort of implied, we are really in a very strange borders here. Uh, let's go back in history. The first thing that I would like to pay attention to is what happened around the crisis of 2008. There was a lot of talk about oil and oil prices, and up to $147 per barrel, and uh, many people were arguing that this cannot be the case that the oil, in this case, is denominated in dollars. How can it happen? Then there was a stories, allegations that there were a group of countries that were beginning to talk about alternative solutions, alternative currency arrangements. Those countries that were mentioned included China, certain uh, Saudi Arabia, I believe, and a few Gulf countries, Russia, Brazil, uh, and so on. So you had a group of some BRIC countries, uh, some countries, emerging Asian countries, and so on and so forth. And the argument at the time was that within 10 years, there might be something more tangible in the offering. We haven't seen it yet, but we have seen more and more uh, direction to, to that kind of a thrust, that kind of momentum. Uh, if you look at the role of the Ramini, first of all, the fact that it became uh, one of the SPR, one of it became part of the, the IMF package, it's a national currency less a year ago, in fact, two years ago, uh, that has meant a lot. And I think that now there's a real effort for portfolio funds and others in Europe, U.S. and elsewhere to use remedy more for diversification. When you look at the monthly account of which countries and which cities uh, use RMB to what extent, you find that Hong Kong is still what is it, 70 percent of the total, 78 percent. But London has a quite central role. Singapore has a grand central role, and uh, you also notice that New York has already a role. So there's a certain inevitability about this, but it doesn't move as fast, I think, that Beijing would like. But also it has counterproductive results from the Beijing point of view. If it strengthens remedy a lot in these times, that can be bad for exporters. But on the other hand, the Chinese economy is moving from exports and investment towards consumption and innovation. So now you have in China the same debate you've had in the US for decades. Uh, if you listen to, should doctor, the dollar be strong or weak? If you are an exporter, you want it to be weak. If you are a multinational, you operate in other countries, you want it to be strong, or you don't care, really, because you, if you're diversified, really internationally. China is getting closer to that point, but it's not quite yet there. My sense, my personal sense is, as I mentioned, that it hasn't happened fast enough for the Chinese authorities, but they have so much to do that that's not exactly a surprise. There have been efforts bilateral through transactions, say, with Iran, with Brazil, with certain European countries already, to uh, replace or augment the US dollar with alternative solutions, which either means uh, I mean, Remedi or whatever other currencies in question. My sense is that these uh, countries who are behind this kind of thing, that their numbers are now double or triple of what it was in 2008. But there is no clear trajectory to that direction yet. However, if what we've seen now in the US goes forward, and it goes forward with this kind of a gusto, I think it's likely to happen faster. And in that case, in other words, if uh, the US dollar really starts strengthening in these circumstances, you have to ask yourself that, all right, if I'm an analyst, certainly the dollar is getting stronger. If the Fed hikes up the rate, certainly should be stronger. But when the debt is $20 trillion, when the fundamentals do not justify it, should we really consider a 